Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Persner, and I am the Director of International Affairs for the Taiwan Wild Bird Federation. And so on behalf of the Taiwan Wild Bird Federation and the Taiwan Endemic Species Research Institute, I would like to welcome you all to this, the fifth uh, webinar in the Major Topics in International Bird Conservation webinar series. This series of talks was created of uh, jumping off the background of the creation of the State of Taiwan Birds 2020 report, Taiwan's first national bird report. Now, this was actually a major milestone in Taiwan's bird conservation. And it is a work that combines the research of many individuals and groups throughout Taiwan, whose studies and projects have in some cases spanned years. It also greatly adds to the dialogue taking place internationally as the global village works towards biodiversity conservation goals. It was published in both Mandarin and English as Taiwanese groups such as the TWBF and TESRI have been working hard in recent years to create more materials that are more accessible to international audiences. Now, it is with that in mind that I would like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Tatsuya Amano of the University of Queensland is primarily interested in how scientists can make meaningful contributions to halting and reversing ongoing, the ongoing global biodiversity crisis. He is particularly committed to tackling gaps in knowledge needed for biodiversity conservation. He focuses on three areas, identifying gaps in existing information and their drivers, overcoming information gaps with modeling approaches, and bridging the research implementation gap. In 2019, he also helped to launch the Translate project, which he will go into in, in a moment. And uh, in order to understand and overcome multiple consequences of language barriers in biodiversity conservation and more broadly, science in general. During his talk, he will share with us how one of the keys to solving the biodiversity and climate crisis is better understanding each other and overcoming language barriers. I feel that this is a topic that we here in Taiwan are very much uh, involved in ourselves and, and are very interested to hear more about. Uh, before Dr. Amano begins his speech, though, I would like to remind everyone that if you have a question, please put your question in the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen, and we will address those questions during the question and answer session at the end of the webinar. And so without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Mao uh, Tatsuya, if uh, you would share your screen, please. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Scott, for the uh, introduction, and I'll start sharing my screen. Can you see it? Okay, great. So shall I start? Okay, uh, so I thank you very much for the kind of introduction. And it is my great pleasure to be able to present our work today at this uh, webinar series. So my name is Tatsuya Amano, currently based at the University of Queensland in Australia. And I'm also the Deputy Director for Research at the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation Science there. So I have been working on a wide range of topics in biodiversity conservation, especially the ecology and the conservation of water bird species. But recently, uh, I have been focusing quite intensively on understanding the uh, language barriers, the consequences of language barriers in biodiversity conservation, especially when uh, implementing evidence-based conservation. And two years ago, uh, we launched this project called the Translate Project. So today I will start with a brief overview of the importance of using scientific evidence in conservation, then uh, introduce our recent work on language barriers in evidence-based conservation. <clears throat> so before I move on to my talk, I just want to say that I'm always deeply impressed by bird monitoring in Taiwan. Obviously this webinar series are related to the recent publication of this report, the State of Taiwan's Post 2020, which I have found to be an amazing source of scientific knowledge on the status of bird species in Taiwan. I'm sure this report will provide critically important scientific evidence for Taiwan's future efforts in conservation science, practices, and policies. And I would like to congratulate you all who are involved in this uh, amazing report for achieving this huge milestone. <coughs> Okay, so back to my talk, as I mentioned earlier, we recently looked at language barriers in evidence-based conservation, and I want to start by defining evidence. Evidence is usually defined as relevant information used to assess one or more hypotheses related to a question of interest. 
or scientific evidence is defined as information that has been collected using a scientific method. So this includes published peer-reviewed studies and unpublished studies in CSS or reports. So this means that evidence can actually consist of very different types of information. <coughs> So why is using scientific evidence important for conservation? It is because relying on non-scientific knowledge, such as personal beliefs, often leads to ineffective conservation practices. Here we have the example of bat countries, which have been believed to aid bat navigation and reduce bat mortality on roads. In the UK, about one million pounds have been spent for the construction of these devices. However, a recent study actually revealed that it's actually not effective, meaning that one million pounds was spent for nothing. <clears throat> and another example is these bird nest boxes installed at exceptional densities under EU's common agricultural policy. Almost any ornithologist can tell you that most birds would not breed at this high density, but due to the lack of proper information, these kind of decisions have actually been made. <laughs> Yet, scientific evidence has rarely been used in conservation. Here we have some examples. Only 33% of conservation papers published between 1998 and 2002 have led to the implementation of some action. Only 23% of decision makers in the UK use scientific papers when compiling management plans. Only 10% of management decisions in Australia use scientific evidence, and so on. There are just so many uh, examples like this. So clearly, scientific evidence is not being used effectively in conservation on the ground. <clears throat> Based on the knowledge that science was not being used effectively in actual conservation, the importance of implementing conservation based on robust scientific evidence called evidence-based conservation uh, has been advocated increasingly in the last 10 years. Evidence-based conservation for the successful example of evidence-based medicine, which revolutionized the effectiveness of medical treatments. An ideal process of evidence-based conservation is like this. First, from millions of individual studies published on conservation, we apply a rigorous method of research synthesis, such as systematic reviews, to compile scientific evidence on the topic of focus. Then we would summarize the compiled set of evidence in an easily understandable way and feed it into a decision support system which in turn can be used by practitioners and policymakers to make their conservation uh, management decisions. <clears throat> and such evidence-based conservation is expected to help overcome major barriers causing the gap between research and implementation. For example, compiling and synthesizing important knowledge from countless numbers of individual studies could make existing evidence easily accessible for decision makers. Also, <clears throat> summarizing the compiled evidence could make otherwise complex scientific messages much simpler and understandable to decision makers. And providing a decision support system would save decision makers time and effort in trying to understand science. Now, let me introduce the Conservation Evidence Project led by Professor William Sutherland at the University of Cambridge in, in the UK, which has been establishing the whole process of evidence-based conservation. In short, the Conservation Evidence Project searches and summarizes evidence from scientific literature about the effect of conservation actions and provides the summarized information for free to support decisions about maintaining and restoring global biodiversity. So on this website, you can browse what kind of conservation actions are effective and not effective for different taxonomic groups and habitats. <coughs> 
For example, if you are looking for some information for the conservation of little towns, you can search the database with the species name and find these three actions and the effectiveness of each action based on existing scientific studies. Previously, if you wanted to take any conservation action, you pretty much had to rely on your own or someone else's personal experience and beliefs, all of which could be highly biased. The alternative was to dive into this vast sea of academic literature, which are often inaccessible to many people, then spending days or weeks searching for the handful of papers that are hopefully relevant to your specific situation. So I'm sure you will agree that this is a huge step forward for evidence-based conservation. <clears throat> so that was a very brief overview of the importance of evidence-based conservation. But earlier, I said that I'm working on language barriers in evidence-based conservation. And you might wonder why languages. So to answer this question, uh, let me first ask you this. How many languages do you think there are in the world? The answer is, <coughs> sorry, uh, it's about 7,000. There are 7,000 languages around the world. And as you know, uh, as conservation scientists, we are starting to recognize increasingly that the biodiversity crisis we are facing now is not only about biodiversity. <coughs> it is about people and biodiversity because people threaten biodiversity people conserve biodiversity, and biodiversity has a lot to offer to people. And these people from around the world use 7,000 languages to communicate. So why would we not take languages into account when studying biodiversity and tackling its conservation? To me, it only seems natural and absolutely necessary to consider how having so many languages among us might affect our understanding and conservation of biodiversity. I would say this perspective has largely been overlooked to date, likely because conservation science has largely been driven by English-speaking countries. <clears throat> but of course we have English, the common language of science, so surely also having many other languages shouldn't be a problem. But is this true? English is indeed the most spoken language in the world, but still only spoken by 1.3 billion people, including non-native speakers. The remaining 6 billion people speak other languages. <clears throat> Let's also take a look at these two maps. The map on the left shows the uh, states and territories where English is the first language. The map on the right is the distribution of threatened species. <clears throat> and as you can see, we have two very contrasting maps. The regions where biodiversity is the richest and is threatened the most, and therefore the conservation is needed the most, are often regions where English is not widely spoken. Let's also look at this, a little bit more detail of why language matters in conservation. Using this example, Eurasian nuthatch. In, in this report, I found Eurasian nuthatch has been declining in Taiwan, meaning you, you might be likely to need scientific evidence on how you should conserve this species in the near future. Then if we look at the geographical distribution of this species, we can see that it's an extremely wide-ranging species. It appears almost everywhere on the Eurasian continent. In fact, across its geographical distribution, uh, 51 official languages are spoken. <clears throat> so this means uh, some knowledge that is useful for its conservation might be available in, say, Russia or some other European countries. <clears throat> So in a study nicely led by Pablo Negret, we looked at the number of official languages spoken within the distribution of each of the 10,000 bird species in the world. Importantly, we found that over one 
1,500 species, including 43 threatened species, had 10 or even more official languages spoken within their distribution range. As you can see in this figure, some threatened species are shown in red, actually have 20, 30, or even 50 official languages spoken within their distribution range. So in order to study and conserve these species, we clearly need to understand the consequences of having so many languages spoken within a species distribution. <clears throat> so now the question is, how exactly language might affect conservation? This diagram summarizes the potential pathways through which language can affect biodiversity conservation. Put simply, having different languages among us can create barriers to information access and barriers to communication. <clears throat> barriers to information access would be inaccessibility to, for example, scientific literature, disseminated information, and policy documents due to the language used. And this affects research practices, policies, and the general public as well. <clears throat> Barriers to communication also have uh, implications at multiple levels. For example, languages can pose a barrier to the development of international collaborations. Language can also impede the formation of effective policy agreements among countries. So today, I will be focusing on barriers to information access, so this part. <clears throat> but please do have a look at this preprint and paper for more details on other consequences of language barriers in conservation. <clears throat> <clears throat> so our Translate project has been investigating the, the many consequences of language barriers in ecology and conservation. So this includes language barriers to the global synthesis of scientific knowledge, language barriers to the local application of scientific knowledge, and language barriers to the career development of non-native non English speakers. And this third type of language barriers is a critically important issue in academia and something we are working on intensively at the moment. But today, I'll talk about the first two types of language barriers and their consequences for evidence-based conservation. So how do language barriers affect the synthesis and application of scientific knowledge in conservation? In this paper we uh, published in 2016, we showed that up to 36% of scientific documents on biodiversity conservation appeared to be published in languages other than English. But such knowing language scientific knowledge is possibly underused in the global level synthesis of scientific knowledge because it's not readily accessible. So for this type of language barriers, we are testing questions like how knowing English science is used in global knowledge synthesis and what the consequences of ignoring such knowing English language science are. And then there's this uh, other type of language barriers where scientific knowledge available only in English is not effectively used in the local application of scientific knowledge, such as local decision-making in countries where English is not widely spoken. So our questions regarding this type of language barriers are, how science available in different languages is being used in local decision-making? and how language barriers impede the uptake of English language science. So overall, our project aims to understand the consequences of language barriers to the use of scientific knowledge by answering these questions. But yeah, so let's first look at these two questions on how language barriers might affect the global synthesis of knowledge. So how is knowing English language science used in global knowledge synthesis? We looked at the proportion of references cited in these eight IPBS assessments by language. Not surprisingly, English language references dominate in most assessments with on average 96% of the references cited being in English. 
And this is in clear contrast to the results we saw earlier that 36% of existing conservation literature was actually written in non-English languages. So this indicates that most of the existing non-English language literature is not being used in global level knowledge synthesis. <clears throat> so next, what are the consequences of ignoring non-English language science? <clears throat> First, by ignoring non-English language science, we could be losing access to a non-negligible amount of scientific knowledge. Again, in this paper, we showed uh, that about one third of the scientific documents on conservation is written in languages other than English, especially in Spanish, Portuguese, simplified Chinese, and French. But this result was based on simple keyword searches. So we recently conducted a series of more comprehensive searches for non-English language literature on biodiversity conservation. And the way we have tested this is by conducting discipline-wide searches for studies that test the effectiveness of conservation actions. As I explained earlier, a conservation evidence project has been identifying scientific studies that test the effectiveness of conservation actions based on a set of selection criteria, but the focus so far has been only on English language studies. So our project has used the same criteria to identify relevant non-English language studies. As part of this, we aim to compare the information that has been published in different languages, namely study location, study spaces, and study designs, in order to understand the consequences of ignoring non-English language science. <clears throat> and we identified 1,234 non-English language studies that provide evidence on the effectiveness of conservation interventions compared to 4,412 English language studies already stored at the Conservation Evidence Database. Actually, these numbers are not directly comparable as there are more English language studies that have been identified by Conservation Evidence Project, but have yet to be stored in the database. But we can at least say that by ignoring no English language studies, we could be losing access to this amount of scientific knowledge. During the searches, we also identified 466 journals in 19 languages, some of which have been publishing papers since the 19th century. So this result alone also indicates that the non-negligible amount of scientific knowledge is still being published in non-English languages too. <clears throat> Many people often assume that such knowing language literature uh, has been diminishing as science is becoming increasingly globalized. But in this study led by uh, Sean Chaudhry, we showed that the, num that the number of publications on biodiversity conservation has actually been increasing in most languages, especially in Spanish, Portuguese, simplified Chinese, and Russian, but also in traditional Chinese as well. So contrary to a common perception, the importance of knowing language knowledge in conservation is certainly not diminishing. <clears throat> and another problem is that ignoring knowing language science can cause severe biases in our understanding of biodiversity and its conservation. There have already been multiple attempts to test such biases mainly in the research area of healthcare. For example, it has been shown that more statistically significant results are more likely to be published in English. So this issue is known as uh, language bias in evidence synthesis, and more specifically, language bias in statistical results, meaning that the nature and direction of a study's results can affect what language it is published in. And we found language bias in statistical results in conservation too. In this paper, uh, we looked, uh, we, we showed that effect size was hugely different between English language studies and Japanese language studies, although all of these studies were used in the same meta-analysis. 
However, a slightly different type of language bias might also exist, especially in ecology and conservation, which is language bias in study characteristics. For example, studies conducted on a local species might be more likely to get published in no English language journals, as those studies would not be of high interest to international readers. And in our latest work, we showed that language bias in study characteristics does exist, having serious consequences for evidence synthesis. In this map, these uh, blue grid cells show the distribution of English language studies, testing the effectiveness of conservation actions stored in the conservation evidence database. And you can clearly see that English language studies are, unsurprisingly, concentrated in certain regions, uh, such as the UK and the US. And there is a huge gap in the availability of evidence in other parts of the world, including the most biodiverse regions, such as Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And I also want to stress that this spatial pattern is extremely common in almost any type of information on biodiversity. Now, when we searched non-English language studies testing the effectiveness of conservation actions using the same criteria, we found a number of relevant non-English language studies in those regions with little information based on English language studies, such as Latin America, uh, Russia, and East Asia, including Japan and Taiwan. So this clearly indicates that there's a systematic bias in study locations between English and non-English language studies. Quite often, global assessments and studies report severe biases in the availability of scientific knowledge. But it seems that those biases are at least partly due to the exclusion of non-English language studies in the global synthesis of scientific knowledge. <clears throat> And it's not only about rotations. Here is a figure that compares the study species between English and the non-English language studies. So these blue bars show the number of English language studies available for each species. For example, the bird species with the highest number of English language studies here was Skylarx, shown here, with 44 English language studies testing interventions for this species. And what's most important here is those red bars showing the number of non-English non language studies per species for those species without any English language studies. So these include 217 bird and 64 mammal species, including this endangered Brachison's fish owls in Japan and the endangered Andean mountain cats in Northern Patagonia. So this result indicates that, again, there's a clear bias in study spaces between English and non-English language studies. And by ignoring non-English language studies, we could be losing important scientific evidence for the conservation of these species. However, we also found a difference in the quality of scientific evidence provided between English and non-English language studies. Here we compared the study designs that have been adopted. And as we can see, studies in these uh, nine languages used less robust study designs, meaning that the quality of scientific evidence could be lower when compared to English language studies. In contrast, uh, Portuguese language and Spanish language studies did not show a significant difference. So also, results varied among languages the quality of knowing language science does seem to be lower than that of English language studies for many languages. So this means that we need to consider the potential trade-off between evidence quality and availability. As we have just shown, for many spaces in countries where English is not widely spoken, evidence may be available only in a lo local language. In which case, using such lower quality evidence might be better than using, than using no scientific evidence at all, but we don't know which is better. But this is something we still need to investigate further. 
Okay, so now let's move on to other questions of how language barriers might affect the local application of scientific knowledge. <clears throat> First of all, how is science made available in different languages used in local decision making? We have been busy identifying national reports on the state of biodiversity in countries where English is not an official language, and we looked at the proportion of references cited in those reports by language. And we were surprised that the very high proportion of non-English language references in most reports shown in uh, yellow and orange in this figure. So across these 37 countries, 65% of the references cited was, on average, in a non-English language. And as you might remember, this is a stark contrast to the IPBS assessments, where only 3.4% of the references were written in non-English languages. <clears throat> And this high proportion of no English language references in national biodiversity reports is partly due to report authors recognizing the importance of no English language scientific knowledge. For example, when we surveyed those report authors, 75% of them answered that they cited no English language papers because they were indeed relevant to their reports. But apparently, it is also because of the English language barriers. A quarter of the report authors answered that they also struggled with understanding English language literature when writing their reports. <clears throat> so this clearly indicates that language barriers indeed pose a serious barrier to the uptake of scientific knowledge that is available only in English. <clears throat> Yeah, we now know that language barriers can have significant implications in conservation. So next, let's look at how species are associated with different languages. So based on Pablo's work I mentioned earlier, Brad Woodworth developed an interactive map showing where we can find bird species associated with each official language. So let me show you what uh, it looks like. Okay, so I need to reload it. But basically, this uh, you can find this interactive map on our project website, which is on uh, translatesciences.translatesciences.com. Translate yep, and here it is. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's look at example of Mandarin. Uh, yep, here it is. So, for example, uh, this shows the distribution of species associated with Mandarin. As you can see, hundreds of uh, bird species, not only in East Asia, but also in Southeast Asia, are associated with Mandarin, meaning that this language is spoken within their, their distribution. So, Mandarin could be a key language when compiling and disseminating information on the conservation of up to 500 species in the Southeast Asian and the Himalayan biodiversity hotspots. And obviously we can look at other languages as well. So let's look at uh, Russian. <clears throat> it is. So this is the map showing the uh, distribution of species associated with uh, the Russian, Russian language. Then you can see that there's hundreds of species across the Eurasian continent uh, associated with this language. So clearly, Russian could be another key language for the conservation of this many species. Okay, so let's go back to the slide. <clears throat> yeah, so this map summarizes the results across languages. Here we found that these areas in Central and Western Asia, shown in wine red, have particularly high numbers of species associated with many languages. So we could perhaps say that paying attention to language barriers could be particularly important for the conservation of species in these regions. <clears throat> Again, now that we know language barriers can have serious consequences for conservation, the question is how we can solve these problems. I would say it's not easy at all, 
and we definitely need a concerted effort at every level, from individuals to institutions and societies. So in this article, we compiled 10 simple tips for overcoming different types of language barriers in science. Here are tips, for, uh, uh, tips in orange represent how we can overcome language barriers to knowledge synthesis. And blue is for barriers to knowledge application. I will not go into the detail of each point, but let me show you a few examples. <clears throat> so first, disseminate research in multiple languages. Some academic journals have recently started recognizing the, recognizing the importance of multi-language dissemination of scientific findings, and now encourage their authors to provide abstracts in non-English languages, and also write a blog post on their papers in other relevant languages. So this is an example of the paper published in the Journal of Applied Ecology. Where we have the, uh, sorry, this is not our paper, but uh, there is a English language blog post as well as a Japanese language blog post. And this is another recent example from the project I'm involved in. With this paper, we were really keen to widely disseminate the importance of teaching evidence based conservation. So we provided abstracts in seven languages and also published free education materials in multiple languages. And it seems that providing no English language abstract does help decision makers. In our survey with authors of national biodiversity assessment, assessment reports, almost half of the authors reported that having no English language titles and abstracts would help them search and understand English language literature. The same approach is applicable to knowledge dissemination to the broader society. <clears throat> For example, the Hong Kong Bird Watching Society and the World Wide Society of Japan have jointly made this education material on spoon built sandpipers in five different languages. Similarly, recently published guidelines of shoreward habitat management were released in seven different languages. So this obviously requires much, much more effort than just producing it in English. But here the motivation was that it's absolutely essential for the material to be actually used by local educators and decision makers across those countries. <clears throat> Next, make sure to use knowledge sourced from multiple languages. Of course, this depends on the focus of your activities, but if you are working on issues that occur across multiple countries, never assume that all relevant information is available in English. One simple yet rarely adopted solution is to find collaborators who are native speakers of different languages, just like we did in this study. In this study. So today, conservation science is highly globalized, so finding native speakers of, for example, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Chinese is not that difficult. But this also highlights the importance of developing culturally diverse environments in academia. You know, we need a diverse range of people to make the best use of knowledge that is available from around the world. <clears throat> You also need to use appropriate literature search systems to find non-English language literature. International search systems, such as the Web of Science and Scopus, index only a few non-English language journals, and so are not very helpful for this purpose. But even on the Web of Science, you can choose to use language-specific databases. Also, these are not selected in the default option, and also depend on institutional subscription. We can also use Google Scholar, which covers pretty much any language, and local literature search systems that are specific to each language. We are hoping to publish a list of these uh, databases in this paper soon. <clears throat> At our Translate project, we have already compiled a list of 466 peer-reviewed non-English language journals in ecology and conservation, uh, which is available on our website. 
And box one of this paper also provides some practical suggestions on how we could make better use of knowing language literature. So please have a read up, read, read, look at this paper as well. So this should be a good starting point for anyone who wants to explore scientific knowledge available in no English languages. <clears throat> also, if you are producing scientific knowledge in no English languages, you can try to increase the visibility of the no English language knowledge. I often upload preprints and presentations in Japanese on Figshare here. And the OSF also stores no English language materials. And the applied ecology resources are also multilingual, encouraging the submission of no English language materials. So instead of leaving important no English language knowledge scattered everywhere, it would be much, much more efficient and searchable if we could collectively store no English language knowledge in these well recognized repositories. <clears throat> okay, so I have been talking about some potential solutions. But as you might have noticed, none of them were actually groundbreaking. And that's where the real problem is. There are such straightforward solutions and yet are rarely implemented. So it's a perfect example of where knowing the path is different from walking the path. And indeed, when we look at how we are dealing with the current pandemic, we can see that quite naturally, efforts are being made to overcome language barriers. <clears throat> For example, the WHO now compiles literature on COVID-19, published in 57, 50, sorry, 56 languages. While the Australian government provides resources on COVID-19 in an impressive 92 languages, 92. But such multilingualization is still far from being common practice in conservation. So what's the difference? Why are we seeing this for COVID, but not for conservation? In my opinion, people are willing to do this for COVID because we are desperate. We are desperately trying to synthesize every single evidence around the world and send messages to every single person around the world. Don't we need to do the same for conservation? Are we in a, desperate, are we in a less desperate situation with conservation than COVID? I don't think we are, but this is definitely a question that is worth asking. And it is actually not only for the pandemic. We actually quite naturally try to solve language barriers when we feel it is important, such as when welcoming, uh, welcoming new students to the university campus, at my daughter's daycare to avoid life-threatening accidents, when trying to discourage people from feeding noisy bars in Brisbane, and of course in Cambridge, England, to keep people off the beautiful grass. So to further advance conservation science, together with people from a diverse range of backgrounds, and to maximize its contribution in tackling global challenges like the biodiversity crisis, I believe efforts to address language barriers need to be made in biodiversity conservation as well. But yeah, so that basically concludes my talk today. Lastly, I'd like to thank all the collaborators of our Translate project for the huge, truly huge contribution. I only speak Japanese and English, Sabi, so our work would literally be impossible without their help. For example, the only phrase in traditional Chinese I know is Qin Gen Wo Pichu. Is it right? <laughs> okay. So I'm sure you know, you now know I need Taiwanese collaborators to identify papers written in traditional Chinese. So we are still working on many other exciting research and solutions. So please do visit our website uh, here. And if you're interested, contact us anytime. Let's work together to solve this uh, hugely important challenge in conservation and science. Okay, great. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you uh, so much, uh, 
Tatsuya for that talk. That was really, really fascinating and very, very interesting on many levels. It's complicated. However, it's something yeah. to definitely think about the way that uh, there's a bias in terms of usage of English language materials and also the need to think about how to go ahead and encourage and uh, push for more non English language materials. And actually, something that uh, you made me think of when you were uh, showing about these uh, Spoonbill Sandpiper pamphlets was mm. actually from Taiwan uh, during the efforts to, to do Blackface Spoonbill conservation in the late mm. 1990s. When, uh, I, when I wrote an article about the Blackface Spoonbill conservation story in Taiwan, and Dr. Lucia Severinghouse, who was a TWBF president at the time, she was explaining that because of the many years of experience that Taiwan had had doing this conservation, they had been working with other partners in the region in order to talk about how to do studies and surveys and also how to even tell a uh, black based boom bill. So they came out with uh, pamphlets in Chinese, Russian, Korean, Japanese, English, and Vietnamese. And yeah, that's amazing. Throughout the, uh, yeah, throughout uh, East and Southeast Asia to friends and partners in conservation because they wanted everybody to be able to tell what a black faced boom bill was, how to go ahead and identify them or differentiate them between egrets and ibis, and mm -hmm. also, um, how to do basic surveys and so this was part of the partnership that was created in order to do those kinds of conservation efforts here yeah in, that's in amazing Asian, story. Asian region and yeah so, so i will definitely uh, introduce that example from my next presentation <laughs> okay that would be yeah that would that's be fascinating story. Uh, yeah. um okay so in order to move on with the uh uh topic uh first i would like to ask you to first uh unshare your screen there Okay, thank you. And now next, we are going to move on to the discussion portion. So during the discussion, uh, I want us to be able to hopefully delve a little bit more into the topic. And so our guest moderator for today is uh, Dr. Ross Tsai. Ross is an assistant professor at the Department of Biological Resources in National Jai University. He is interested in topics such as evaluating the association between landscape patterns and avian community structure. And his recent works include projects for endangered species such as russet sparrow and Australasian grass owl, conserving and uh, conservation and monitoring, raptor migration ecology, and mobbing behavior of passerines. So first, I'd just like to say, Ross, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the way that I hope that this can work is that, uh, Ross, if you would like to ask uh, Tatsuya some question or give him some comment about the topic that he had just brought up, and then uh, Tatsuya can answer. Or actually, Tatsuya, also, if you have a question for Ross, you can feel free to ask him as well. It goes both ways. <laughs> and hopefully there could be a good talk based off of that. That's right. And if I have any thoughts, I will also go ahead and add them. And also, again, after this, we'll be having the question and answer session. So during that time, we will be asking the questions that have been uh, provided by the by in our question and answer box. And so without further ado, uh, Ross, if you'd like to ask a question, feel free. We have up to 30 minutes for this uh, portion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Scott. And uh, thank you, Tatsuya, for this wonderful talk. Yeah, and uh, as being a Taiwanese and who went to US to get my PhD degree, I'm certainly aware of the language barrier and uh, how much difficulties a person need to overcome to just to communicate in life and also in science, especially in conservation science. But and to, to be honest, I didn't really realize how serious this issue impact our understanding and uh, implication about conservation. So uh, again, thank you again for introducing this topic to a lot of people. And uh, one interesting note is that, yeah, and this summer, and through the introduction to, through DALI, I joined uh, one of the workshop Dr. Amano held about language barrier really? in scientific Ooh, communication. <laughs> and uh, I, I also stay and uh, afterward and participate in the project. So I, I also worked on 20 something journals to, to get all Ooh, the information. Really? <laughs> so yeah, maybe yeah, because of the name I used. Yeah, so yeah. I didn't realize I was in the group, but yeah, I, through the whole process, it really made me understand more about how it's really a big gap. And uh, it takes 
a lot of efforts from different dimensions and to, to overcome this issue. So, and that's especially after hearing you talking about what you have been doing for the past couple of years to, to overcome this. And uh, I, I really admire the, what you have done. So thank you again. Thanks so much. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. When I was during the process, working with your current project and also listening throughout your talk. So like, I know that in academia, like for me personally, we are trained to publish in English and in SCI paper. And sometimes we are kind of forced to do that because it will, school count that as credit for promotion and evaluation, not for Mandarins. So yeah. which seriously reduce the motivation for scientists to publish in their native language. Do you have any thought and comments on how to overcome this? Because I know this is kind of a big systematic issue. Yeah, but I, I guess a lot of the country have that similar situation as well. Yeah, definitely. That, that's a big issue. So obviously the motivation for most people now is try to publish scientific findings in English because it's more influential, it's more, you know, it has more credibility and it's also related to your, you know, promotion or, you know, recognition. But obviously, because as I explained in my presentation, language barriers are always a multifaceted problem. So the consequences are for two directions. So if you are increasingly publishing your scientific findings only in English, Obviously, that scientific finding may not be easily accessible to many people who are not that fluent in English. So that is another problem. And then, but, you know, most people in uh, non-English speaking countries then need to spend extra efforts for disseminating your research in your own, you know, local language. And then that obviously cost you a lot in terms of time and efforts that needs to be spent. So this is a really huge issue. And one thing I want to really, uh, I really want to emphasize and tell people around the world is that this problem is not the problem only for non-native English speakers. So, you know, like us, non-native English speakers in Japan, Taiwan or anywhere, tend to think this is a problem for our own, you know, this is a, our own problem. So we, we need to solve this problem. But through our project, I, I really want to show this is actually not a, pro, not a problem only for non-native non -native English speakers, but also for native English speakers, because by ignoring no English language science, they, those people could lose access to this amount of scientific knowledge. So by showing this kind of things, I've tried, I'm, I'm now trying to increase the awareness of this problem in, in scientific, international scientific communities. So it's not, it's not easy to solve you know, these problems, but hopefully increasing this awareness could help the societies and the international communities solve this problem in the near future. Okay, thanks. And uh, actually, one other thing that about this topic that uh, you mentioned some examples are like uh, people after having this awareness and trying to publish things in multiple languages. And I think the state of Taiwan Bird 2020 is a very good example because now we know that it's locally to the Taiwanese is very important. And also we want other people to, to be able to know what we are doing and what's the current status. So for this kind of, like, because this is a government publication and uh, the people there, I mean, especially from like Scott and Dali, they have the awareness of doing that. And I know that some journal have started to, to do that as well, at least for some like abstract. But even like, but personally, I think like uh, when I have maybe finished or halfway finished a project 
and I think okay, it's about time to to get it published. To me, it's like I have to choose one because well, I, if I publish in Mandarin and I publish the same thing in scientific journal, they will say that because they, they don't want this duplication and this they will have some like ethical issue. So mm-hmm. I kind of have to choose. Yeah. And sometimes it is very hard, a uh, very hard decision. Do you have any experience with that? And then how would you encourage like a local or non-native, non-English speakers to to do that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, that is a big question. And uh, I have to admit, for example, uh, based on my own experience, my most of my publications are in English. So basically I chose to publish my scientific knowledge in English only. But then I will try to do my best for disseminating the scientific knowledge in other languages as well. So just like I, just, just as I explained in my presentation, I tried to, I normally try to provide abstract titles in different languages and also write a blog post in other languages. I mean, in my case, in Japanese. And then also, you know, ask my collaborators to do the same, to, you know, provide abstract in, for example, Spanish, Portuguese, and also write a blog post. For example, the, the paper we published in Prose Biology about the uh, importance of knowing Shrang science recently. So it's Amano et al. 2021 in Prose Biology. So for that paper, because we involve so many native speakers of different languages, we provided abstract in almost 17 languages. And we also wrote a blog post, kind of, you know, article in conversation, in the conversation. So it's, you know, well-known blog post, blog type uh, website. So we wrote a, uh, sorry, we wrote an article for the conversation in two languages, in, in English and in Spanish. And we also disseminated our research, for example, on Twitter in multiple languages. So that kind of multilingualization is possible, especially because you, especially if your research involves uh, many native speakers of different languages. So obviously, I'm aware that the extra effort is necessary to do that, but that is. Uh, in my opinion, that is something we need to do if we choose to publish our science in English. Yeah, so yeah, there is always a dilemma. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I seems like the personal awareness mm. and willingness to 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 overcome that is is is, is the first step. Yeah. Yeah. Especially that, for that, the scientific it, group. Yeah. Coming yeah, but. This actually applies to any speakers of any languages. For example, for native English speakers, you know, if if the research is about you know global scale phenomena, you know, global scale conservation or anything, it, it should be associated with you know translations into different languages. So you know, biodiversity hotspots are quite often found, as I explained, biodiversity hotspots are quite often found in non-English speaking countries like you know South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. So to disseminate the scientific knowledge to those countries, even native English speakers need to invest some efforts, extra money to to multilingualize their scientific knowledge. So it's not only for our own problem, but for the international societies. That's that's very true. I guess the next question I want to ask, there, there may be a lot of the audience have the similar idea. You, you mentioned a very interesting result about how language barrier can have bias in because of statistic result and the study characteristics. So like here, the, today the audience here are in Taiwan and uh, Taiwan is a very small country. So by default, a lot of the studies will be local scale. So <laughs> it's just, it will be more difficult to publish. And especially if you're working on a single species. 
-hmm. and it's actually personally to to me it's true like i work on the australasia grayson and the russet sparrow and those are species are either in least concern status mm -hmm. or it's a common species actually mm -hmm. but in taiwan it's in danger so mm -hmm. when we try to publish or try to go through this process actually we will, I, I got a lot of rejections based on the, the characteristic, okay, so yeah, single, yeah. single species. And I yeah. guess that most people's work is, is related to that because yeah. not everybody is able to access to many resources to conduct like a large scale or multi-species project. So what's your suggestions or to, to yeah. most of us? That is another fundamental problem in academia, obviously. So uh, I still work on many work on many issues in Japan. So I have many collaborators in Japan, and quite often we also we we face the same difficulties. You know, based on my experience, this topic. You know, I I just think this topic might go into this journal, but the response from the journal could be quite different from my. You know first impression so that is the actually the problem at the side of journals you know quite often recently many journals are trying to become their state represent as an international journal so they are trying to choose you know broader scale studies multi-species studies and that could lead to a huge bias in the scientific scientific knowledge published in those journals. And then quite often those journals claim, you know, there is a bias or, you know, gaps in the availability of scientific studies published. But that is actually the problem with those journals. So I believe that problem should be solved from the journal's end. So journals should invest more to try to publish those local scale studies as well. And there are some journals who are where those local scale studies could be published as well. For example, recently, uh, emerging journal like uh, Ecological Solutions and Evidence in the, uh, published by the British Ecological Society do not necessarily uh, think the, you know, that kind of things, like the scale of the study or if it multi-species studies or not. But that essentially tries to publish as many studies as possible. So maybe you can choose that kind of journals when publishing your local scale studies. Yeah, but I think largely speaking, that is a problem with journals. So that is something we need to, for example, we need to show the evidence that this is actually happening. And for example, we can also show the consequences of this. And then with that evidence, we can, you know, talk with journals. Yeah, so, yeah, sounds like bringing this awareness to, like, the editor-in-chief or mm, associate yeah, editor. Definitely. Really, yeah, definitely. It's very important in, because I think this kind of rejection, I mean, best rejection is a lot of them are just based on, okay, this is a small scale and uh, yeah. single species, and then they will just reject it outright without yeah. looking at the, the evidence or the, the qualities of the paper. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. So I'm always thinking like, you know, some like even top ecology journals should have sections for each region to reduce geographical bias in their publications. For example, I don't know, maybe Journal of Applied Ecology, might can have a section for Asia and another section for Africa. And then within that section, they can choose the best available studies in each region and then publish those studies. By doing that, they, those journals could reduce the geographical biases in their publications. So this is something I'm always trying to implement with journals mm -hmm. but perhaps I, I don't have many connections with those journals so you know if if anyone knows any 
editors who might be interested in this kind of ideas. I would be happy to talk with them. Yes, that, that's, that's very true. The, just the following question on this. The, have you looked at how different journals or I mean, how like a different impact factor or different the scope that they claim in their, in their website on the, like how local or how globally, I mean, researches that are in, they, they actually accept in their journals. Mm, uh, yeah, so obviously the, in the project you are involved in, so we are trying to understand the level of commitment by each journal to yes. addressing language barriers. So this is something uh, where we are trying to understand how different journals are, you know, trying to overcome language barriers. So in that process, we are uh, investigating some basic information on each journal's website, but we haven't, we might, I don't think we have looked at the, the scope of each journal. We might have some basic information, but it's not, you know, it's not that clear if each journal is targeted at the international audience or specific region. So, yeah, we don't have that kind of, you know, detailed information, I think. Well, it, I guess it's the, the data will be harder to, to, to get because you probably need to go into, I mean, a set of journal Mm. articles and then to look at what the, the scope really is about to, to determine yeah, yeah. that. Okay. And why have another question about you uh, earlier, you mentioned about conservation evidence. Yeah. So, and those are, you think are, are the key things that for the conservation management or practitioners should follow and mm. to work on. And I, I realized like, like in Taiwan, there are some researches about like uh, endangered species or other species of interest. And, uh, but they may not be necess necessarily focused on the need of management and the angle may not target the questions. So that's the result cannot be used directly in conservation. So how do we minimize this gap? Sorry, so did you say, so they uh, some research, but the answer or the, the, the design may not be directly designed for that management process. Okay, okay, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's a great point. So that is the typical example of the research implementation gap. So the purpose of the management side is hugely different from the purpose of scientists. Yeah. So scientists might prefer this type of studies, yeah. for example, for publishing in a high profile journal, but actually what, what is needed, what is required at the management side could be hugely different. So that is a yeah, typical example. And then I think one potential solution is just communicate between communication between these different groups. So for example, you can design your study with conservation practitioners based on their you know, demand requirement, and then possibly involve those people in your, in your study as well. And then by, by doing that, you, you should be able to uh, do studies that, are, that could be actually used in conservation management. So yeah, I, I think, I mean, communication is uh, the, the, the thing I think is very crucial in this. Yeah, in the yeah. Yeah, because. Yeah. If, but it's, it's, it's also true that that kind of study is not, you know, not published in high profile journals. So it's very similar to your, your problem. For example, uh, most studies stored in conservation evidence database are not necessarily published in high profile journals. There are some, you know, some papers published in Nature or Science, I think, but most of them are, you know, local scale, even single species studies. 
And those studies are actually quite important in the conservation evidence database because that, that provides the exact evidence on the effectiveness of conservation interventions. So that, that is another big issue that we discussed earlier. So we need to recognize the importance of such single-scale, local-scale studies in, in academia. Yeah, true. Yeah, Scott, how many how long do oh, we have? Oh, we're we're okay. We could go on for a few more minutes. I actually am kind of curious, based off of what we're just talking about, though. Uh, Tatu, do you have any suggestions about where funding comes from in order to help oh, us doing right. these things? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I'm also curious to know if there's any funding available, but. Uh, so our project has been funded by the Australian government, Australian Research Council, which was mm. actually surprising for me. You know, Australia is a, a native English speaking country, mm. but it's quite multicultural. So mm. that might be the reason the Australian Research Council uh, was interested in our project. But I'm mm. still looking for other available fundings. And I think there might be, for example, something that the aim of which is to facilitate, you know, research communication or mm. yeah, something like that. So it may not be necessary. It, it may not necessarily be a research grant, but mm. something related to you know research communication dissemination mm. might be appropriate for this type of activities. Yeah, and then, I don't know. Uh, just uh, yeah, because I mean, it's it's really hard because, you know, as as, mm -hmm. as Ross was saying, as you were saying, a lot of times, you know, publish or perish, right? You have to go mm -hmm. ahead and try yeah, and get out true. some kind of a paper, some kind of a study in order yeah. to be able to continue to stay relevant. And so a lot of times people are just trying to get an English study out mm -hmm. there because the bigger journals are in that language. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, it's, it's hard, you know, and yeah. so uh, trying to see if there were any kind of uh, if there were any new organizations or any kind of uh, in multinational uh, NGO or, or foundations that were encouraging to do this yeah. kind of work. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So uh, my, my opinion is even for the, you know, just normal funding like Australian Research Council or, for example, in Japan, there's a funding from JSPS, Japan Society for Promotion of Science. So even for mm. that kind of normal research funding, we should... My opinion is we should cost, we should, you know, request the cost for multilingualized dissemination, for example, mm. for translating our abstracts. So that mm. is something we are, I'm now doing for my current research grant. But we mm -hmm. that, that kind of request should be allowed. And I'm not sure if it, that is possible in Taiwan, but we should mm. definitely try to request the cost for that. And then by accumulating the scientific evidence, like the evidence I showed in this presentation, we should be able to appeal the importance of materialization in those, you know, funders as well, for funders as well. So, mm. you, you know, it's a long way to go, but still, I think we need to, we need to emphasize the importance of materialization, mm -mm. even for funders, yeah. Well, because I mean, I, I maybe Ross could speak more to this, but I mean, in the past, there was a much bigger focus on, you know, trying to publish in English, but locally within Taiwan, there is re more recently been a push to go ahead and expand the ability of languages within Taiwan. So focusing on like Aboriginal language study, or also on Hakka, Taiwanese, mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to just regular yeah, Mandarin yeah. spoken and tradition, writing traditional Chinese. However, mm -hmm. it's hard because when you live in, you know, a multilingual yeah. society, there's many different languages in one place. <laughs> yeah. And it's hard yeah, to go true. ahead and figure where to go ahead and put, put the focus because, you know, in Taiwan also, uh, Aboriginal communities, they have traditional knowledge and traditional relationships mm. with things. And, and, and so being able to discuss environmental topics and conservation topics, like, like yeah. you were saying, you know, there's a lot to be able to understand to be able to be understood. But again, language barriers within countries mm. themselves. I mean, yeah, in, in yeah. Japan, is there also this problem with uh, many different languages? Uh, also, we, we have some, you know, indigenous languages as well. But uh, yeah, I haven't heard of any, for example, attempts to overcome this kind of language barrier in Japan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
we tend to quite often we tend to assume Japanese is the language for dissemination. Mm. And so we are still, you know, just struggling with the the knowledge transfer between English and Japanese, but not mm-hmm. as a you know relatively smaller languages. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think that is another issue in Japan as well. And, yeah, and, and obviously there is a big issue in Australia as well because there are just yeah. so many indigenous languages. And I've, I've just recently heard that there is a there was an attempt to to translate kind of you know dissemination materials originally published mm-hmm. in English to other relevant indigenous languages. But quite often, you know, we, you, you, they may not have necessary funding, as you said. And then quite often that kind of activities has a lower priority. So that is, a, I think that is a reality now. And that's why I, I believe we should definitely invest more. Yeah. yeah. Well, so then my other question then is because you were saying that from the middle there, you had two different directions, which mm. it was going, it was one was, working on the local level and one was working on trying to encourage the acceptance or, or better communication on the international level. Yep. Do you find that there is a focus on one area more than another, such as there's more going on in terms of working on trying to get non-English into the international or trying to get English into the local? And, and, and Yeah. So I think just because non-native English speakers are already aware of you know, one direction. So the, the necessity of uh, translating English language knowledge into local languages. So, you know, we are aware of that program. So that, that mm-hmm. activity is quite often uh, implemented already. But the other program, so essentially the ignorance of non-English language science is, has mm-hmm. been overlooked largely. So I think that is the, the, the area we need more, more, effort, more concerted effort. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That is something okay. I feel. Um, yeah. All right. No, this has been a really great conversation, a uh, really interesting discussion. And great. thank you yep. so much, Ross, uh, thank for, you. for going ahead and do that. But um, uh, Tatsuya, are yep. you still there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm right. sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> you disappeared for a moment. Okay. So <laughs> basically what we're going to do now is we're going to move to the question and answer session. Okay. Yep. Okay, I, and so uh, I will start off with the first question there for you. And the first question is, frequently it appears that governments have an incentive to keep dissemination of scientific evidence to a minimum when, for example, mm. it potentially conflicts with policy concerning government development oh. initiatives. Could you, okay. please, would you be able to comment on that? And then there's a second part. It's a very long question, I'm sorry. But following okay. on the above observation, it is clear that generally speaking, the less is known about biodiversity of an area, the less likely threats to a species will be cited as an obstacle to, uh, to a development project. And so more resources can, can be spent on it, such as time, research, and money. And so would you be able to, Dis- would you be able to speak to any uh, to this to these okay, two different so topics? I guess the first part is about the conflict between the scientific research, the, the scientific findings, and the the policy government. Yeah. I guess, yeah, mm, yeah, yeah. So that is another issue. So it's not necessarily related to language barriers only, but that is a kind of typical another typical example of the reason for uh, the research implementation gap. So the, the, what the government wants to do can be different from the you know, scientific recommendation or suggestions. And yeah, so I guess that is a huge problem. And I guess I don't have any specific recommendation, but I guess this is something we still lack scientific studies or scientific activities. You know, we mm. as scientists, are quite often focused only on doing science. But actually, when considering scientific application, like the application for conservation, we need to we need to make the government or any other relevant stakeholders use scientific knowledge. Mm. And this is a typical example 
where that kind of communication is impeded. So yeah, over in gen general speaking, I think we need to we we need to we try we we, sh we should try to understand more of this kind of problem, and then we, mm. we need to devise the solution. I don't sorry, I don't know what the solution is, but we need to think about it and then try to provide solutions. Yeah. Mm. I'm sorry. What the second part is? Oh, the the second part was more of a more of a comment be, uh, than yeah. because basically, uh, based off of that, the observation was that the less is known about biodiversity of an area, the less likely threats can be cited as an obstacle to development. So the developers mm -hmm. could save on having to devote resources to research surveys or mitigation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah. that that was the first question. And yeah. so now we have the second question you. for you. The second question is the proportion of GBIF, uh, Global Biodiversity Information Facility data in Asia is much less. And so do you think that this is also the influence of language barriers and whether there are relevant studies being conducted about this or do you have any policy recommendations about that? Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, I'm not sure this person knows our work on GBIF, but we actually looked at this in a previous paper. So we looked at how uh, records stored in the GBIF are distributed across different countries. And obviously mm -hmm. it's concentrated in certain regions like the UK and the US. And then we looked at drivers, the predictors of the spatial distribution. And we mm -hmm. tested multiple different predictors, but one of which is the uh, proportion of uh, English speakers in different countries. And some others are like the wealth of the country represented by uh, GDP per capita, and geographical location or security level of each country. And then actually the language barrier, the proportion of English speakers was one of the strongest predictors of the, the spatial distribution in GBIF records. So that actually means the, the, this, you know, this comment is correct. So the GBIF records could be, tend to be uh, fewer in countries where English is not widely spoken. And that obviously relates to the uh, scientific communication. Maybe, you know, there are maybe some data, some relevant data might exist in those countries like Japan, Taiwan, but maybe due to the lack of enough scientific communication, those data may not be uploaded to GBIF. Or some in some other countries, maybe that actually means the scientific data may not exist in those countries as well. But, uh, and then obviously we can solve this problem as well. So as you probably know, you know, EBART is now translated, kind of, you know, implemented in Taiwan as well with the local language. And then I've heard that hugely increased the participants and the data submission to eBot. And then quite recently, actually, eBot was also implemented in Japan with Japanese. So I'm expecting to see a huge increase in the, the submission and the use of eBot in Japan as well. So mm -hmm. this is a typical example where by overcoming language barriers, this kind of bias and uh, gaps in data availability might be solved as well. Yeah, so this is, a, I think this is a great point, yeah. I, I was just gonna say, I guess it really is a situation where at that point, the algorithm of eBird is able to really go ahead and make everything universalized because even though they're putting yeah. it in the, your own language, it can still go ahead and trans, uh, yeah. translate itself. So you yeah. can still go ahead and see on that on that kind of a, a even even level. Yeah, that's true. And then obviously the, the data submitted to EPOD are also sent to GB as well. So, mm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, next question. Uh, question number three. Many endangered shorebirds breeding in uh, wintering grounds, they cover multiple countries and languages. From a conservation perspective, how can Taiwan cooperate with other countries to provide more conservation strategies? Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, I guess this is another typical example where the overcoming language barriers is, is key. So this affects almost any level from research, like you know, accumulation of scientific knowledge, 
and then, you know, doing conservation activities, developing collaborations, and reaching, you know, policy agreements. So almost in any level, overcoming language barriers, and quite often, uh, more generally speaking, overcoming cultural barriers, cultural differences, could be an important aspect to, to achieve th- these objectives. So, yeah, so those migratory species, especially, you know, shore birds, water birds, are the uh, excellent example, I think. Mm. Mm. And do, do you find that there's now more interaction, more conversations going on specifically about these kinds of shorebirds or, or water birds in, in our region here in Asia? Yeah, that is something we are very interested to know. So we, we haven't look, uh, looked at that specifically, mm-hmm. but we are really keen to know if, how, or to what level language barriers can, can impede this kind of you know, collaboration or policy agreements, etc. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, next question. So can you suggest what research institutes can do to help make research published in English journals by the institute's researchers more visible to local uh, local language readers or yeah. conversely to help more case studies in local languages be seen by English readers? Okay, okay. So for, for disseminating English language studies to local languages, one thing the institute in institution can do is obviously a press release or or any kind of you know blog writing blog post or that kind of you know making the scientific knowledge accessible in an easily understandable way. So obviously if a researcher in that institute publish a paper in English, you know the, the institute in, in, in institute can try to you know encourage the researcher to write a blog post in a local language and also you know issue a press release in local language as well that kind of activities is is there are many many options for that kind of activities for uh, in, in, uh, in sorry, institutional level so there are many things they can do and for the other uh, so which one yeah, for, for the other one, uh, the to to disseminate non-English yeah. language uh, scientific papers in English. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe if if the journal is published by that institute, maybe they can try to provide English language abstract titles. If there's they haven't done that yet, and yeah, what else? What else we can do? Yeah, so that, that kind of multi humanization should be able mm-hmm. to be done by institutional level, I think. And I mean, does that, does that answer the question? Sorry. Well, I, think, I think so, but I'm also kind of curious uh, if <laughs> using conservation evidence or using the Translate webpage, would there be resources for people interested in trying to learn more about how to uh, publish works in? Or, or to address these kinds of issues? Uh, yeah, so... So, for if, for example, uh, researchers are interested in identifying uh, scientific findings published in other languages, for example, for, for people in Taiwan, maybe public scientific literature published in Japanese, or scientific literature published in Spanish, because we have already uh, created a list of journals published in no English languages. So that list might be useful to start with. So you can look at those journals for relevant scientific papers published in different languages. So that could be one uh, potentially useful resource. And for in terms of conservation evidence, so the, the, the project, the, the conservation evidence implemented uh, machine translation from the website. But obviously we know machine translation is not, always, not always perfect. So it does not always help, but uh, would be probably better than having nothing. So they can use that kind of technological mm-hmm. solution on the website. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so potentially looking at the website of Translate or Conservation Evidence could lead to maybe uh, a better way to maybe find out these kinds of answers and finding these yeah. kinds of journals which might provide these opportunities. Yeah, and of course, uh, on our website, we have, we provide a uh, list of 10 tips for overcoming mm -hmm. language bar barriers in science. So that, that is the the uh, the same tips published in the paper I, I showed him during my presentation, but we mm -hmm. published the same content, essentially, essentially mm -hmm. the same content on our website as well. So yeah, please do have a look at the list of 10 tips as well. Okay, okay. Yeah. So next question, question number five. So question number five essentially means that there's many very urgent uh, conservation issues that are going on right now in the world. And so in addition to research findings or evidence that do not directly uh, address conservation action, uh, there's research is often perceived by local conservation, this says too slow, outdated or idealistic. So do you have any anything that you could say to how to improve upon that because it, it, it does take a, a long time to go ahead and go through through the yeah, process and, yeah. so, and so being able to provide evidence or be <laughs> able to share something it might yeah. take a long so time I guess, before it's so i guess that 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 that, that is the main motivation for the conservation evidence to start that project so it, sorry it's not my project so the project was has been led by professor william sutherland at the university of cambridge but the main objective of the project, and actually the evidence-based conservation is, you know, beforehand, we should synthesize the best available knowledge for conservation. So there is already, mm -hmm. already a database of any relevant studies. So for this mm -hmm. kind of urgent issues, they can just look at the website and then try to find relevant evidence. So that is the main motivation of the, uh, the project, conservation evidence project. But I'm also aware that in many cases, people may not be able to find relevant evidence as well because of the gaps in the, the relevant uh, scientific findings, scientific evidence. So that is the main problem of this kind of activities. But uh, I think having that database is a huge advantage because you know you don't need to spend you, you don't need to start new research if the relevant evidence is available. Mm -hmm. So that is a potential solution for this kind of problem. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank but you. I know there is a gap between you know the, there is a gap in the time scale between scientific studies mm -hmm. and the, the demand from the ground level conservation. Mm, definitely, yeah. definitely. Uh, okay, number six is, are there any websites that do not have any age restriction for those who wish to publish their own journal, uh, let alone publish in their own languages? And is there a way that students can participate in species conservation? So what is the age restriction in, sorry, did you say age restriction for publishing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think yeah. any there's any age restriction for okay. um, publishing papers. For example, recently, there's one really interesting example from Japan. So one, uh, I think, primary school student has mm -hmm. been studying uh, the beetles, you know, uh, rhino beetles. How do you say? Kabutomushi in Japanese, you know. Yeah, yeah, right beetle. Beetle, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that beetle. So that, that student, you know, primary school student, like, I don't know, 10 years old or something. So he mm -hmm. has been studying that beetle as a part of, you know, the school's homework. And then just mm -hmm. because he, he has collected so much data, so much information on something, sorry, I, I couldn't remember the detail. So he essentially worked mm -hmm. with a university lecturer or someone and then published a paper in Koji. So one of the top journals in Koji. So there's, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there's no age restriction to publication. So if you have any, you know, bright ideas or you know, great data set, quite often long term data set, you 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 should be able to publish your work in any journals. Mm. Okay. Yes. And and sorry, the what, what is the second 
part. Oh, and so the second part was just asking you if you had any any uh, any suggestions on ways that students could participate in species conservation. Yeah, there, there are just so many options. <laughs> so obviously, you know, just participating in eBot could help as well because your mm. records from your bird watching activities will then be fed into the you know global system and then mm. record it as a important scientific data. So just doing mm. bird watching and then submitting your records through eBot is one way. But also there are many other activities done quite often done by you know NGO or any conservation organizations to do actual on-ground conservation. So you can particip participate in that kind of activities as well. And as, as I said, you can also do scientific research as well. Maybe you can work mm -hmm. with some you know, experts, like someone based at the university to, mm -hmm. to develop your scientific knowledge and you know, learn how to analyze your data, how to write a paper. So yeah, mm -hmm. you, you should be able to have so many other so so many options to be involved in conservation mm. activities and science as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great. So question number seven. Number seven is that some species in Taiwan are are threatened or endangered and need to be protected and conserved, but actually their global population uh, is, is 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 still stable in other areas. And yet there may be less information or literature about these species. So how can Taiwan get in contact with these other countries in order to get more information about those populations? Yeah, that's great, great point. And yeah, I don't have any, you know, bright ideas to solve this kind of problem, but I guess we, we just need to accumulate scientific evidence on, for example, on the status of this species in Taiwan. For example, if it's subspecies, maybe, you know, the trends, the population trends of that subspecies could be hugely different from other subspecies in, for example, in Europe or anywhere else. So I guess one potential problem here is the lack of scientific information. So if you have you know, like in your report, if you have clear evidence showing, you know, this species is declining in Taiwan by how much, and then you can have this information to negotiate. I don't know how to describe it, but to, to talk with other people in other countries. For example, maybe IUCN or any other international conservation organizations to, mm -hmm. to, to, to make them know the situation in Taiwan. So in that mm -hmm. sense, producing scientific evidence, you know, ideally as a peer-reviewed paper is a really important first step. Because you, you, you can provide the concrete evidence to international communities. Mm. Yeah. yeah, however, do you have any, uh, any suggestion for ways to maybe uh, get in touch? Or, or ways to find out who might uh, who might be best people to get in contact with, you know. Yeah, in, 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 I guess it, it, it really be, depends on depends on species. For example, if mm. it's so assuming we are talking about bird species, you know, if it's water bird mm. species, maybe I don't know. Wetland International has been conducting, you know, global uh, sorry international water bird census, so they might be the key contact point in terms of the conservation of water about species. And yeah, for other species, yeah, I'm not that familiar with other, other like terrestrial species, but there, there must be something similar to Veteran International at the international okay. level, I think. Okay, yeah. okay. All right, uh, um, next question. So currently, uh, you're addressing the issue of potential bias where the relevant information is not available in local languages. Are you aware of anyone looking at the reverse situation, such as where the local language reports, such as a locally prepared survey concerning impact of a foreign sponsored development project of bats or birds is withheld or not accurately translated into English? Mm. So you mean the uh, important knowledge is published in local languages, but not translated in English? Uh, yes. 
Sorry. Is yeah, we're, okay. we're basically, so there's a report that's done and it's done in the, in the local language. However, when it gets translated into English, it's not translated accurately. And so it doesn't actually, uh, uh it, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have, yeah. So is it the, is it the issue of accuracy in translation? It seems to be the issue of, of withholding the information. I think that the question is really just trying to ask if, if you've heard of any of this, any of this kind of situation. Yeah. Where, yeah. It's basically asking if you've had that experience or if you've ever heard of that, that kind of a situation taking place. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, I guess many, for example, many of the governmental report. So mm. in another uh, sub project of a uh, you know translate project, we we have been working. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I showed some of the results from that part of the project. But we have been investigating the national level governmental quite often governmental assessment reports on the status mm. of biodiversity in each country, mm -hmm. and many of those reports are probably not translated in English, so they are mm -hmm. just published in the local language because the ta target audience is the, you know, those people who speak that language, for example, Japanese in Japan. But that kind of reports has, you know, huge amount of scientific knowledge, scientific information. So it could be quite important at the international level as well. But quite often those reports are not translated. So I think that is a good example of known English scientific knowledge hidden under the language barrier. So, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if that answers this question, but I, I think in, in a roundabout way, I think that the, the the question was just trying to see if if you had ever heard of an experience where uh, what was going on in in one place uh, in in a local language wasn't necessarily reflected in that same mm. way when it got translated into English. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll say I don't know any example. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so the next question, question number nine, is how much attention is given to language barriers in each country? Do countries care if their local case studies are seen by the international community? So I guess it really depends on the country. So mm -hmm. you know, it, you know, uh, I I say no non-native English speaking countries, but there is a huge variation among those countries as well. So, mm. you know, in some countries that people just speak fluently, many, many people just speak fluently English. And in mm. that kind of countries, maybe language virus may not be a huge issue. But in mm. other countries, you know, if the, you know, average level of English proficiency is relatively low, the consequences of language, language barriers could be much higher. So it really depends on countries i think but again i'm not sure if this answers this question sorry what what is the second okay. part so, okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> so for the the first question though i think that what the question is is trying to ask is um in say for uh do you have any experience in a uh, better understanding the way that in certain countries they might be more focused on addressing language barrier issue mm -hmm. or certain countries which are unable or or don't want or don't are un are unable to pay as much attention to the to the language barrier issue because as you've said earlier it goes uh different levels in different places mm. right so, so do you I mean the that, consequence of that that kind of difference in countries uh, the, uh, in a way the consequence uh however I, I, the feeling that I get from the question is just okay. that, basically they, that they're, they're, they're trying to ask you about, uh, in, in your experience, if there are certain countries, like say, for instance, maybe Japan or in Australia. So yeah, using these two as, ex as examples, would you be able to say, uh, what would you say is the level of attention in Australia and uh, mm -hmm. Japan that are given to uh, addressing the language barrier issue? Mm. It's different or not. I mean, uh, if I, I've seen the difference in between countries, mm. yeah, uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, as I said, it depends on really, it really depends on countries. But for example, if we focus on native English speaking countries, I guess, for example, Australia is uh, really aware of this kind of problem because it's fundamentally culturally diverse communities. So, uh, as I explained in my presentation, they 
quite often try to, I mean, the Australian government quite often tries to solve the language barrier by providing translations. And often, uh, for example, for people coming from other countries, they, I think they provide free interpreters, for example, in medical healthcare settings, for example, in hospitals. So that kind of activities is quite normal, often uh, uh, prevalent in Australia. But I'm not sure if that is applicable to other native English speaking countries like the UK. So I'm sure there, there is a huge variation between countries, even in uh, native English speaking countries. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure about the US, but maybe you might know better. Okay. All right. And so the other question was, uh, do you feel as though it, countries care and that if there are certain countries which necessarily care if their uh, local case studies are seen by the international community? Uh, yeah, that's another hard question. I think most mm -hmm. countries are aware of the importance of local case studies, but uh, I'm not sure many countries are aware of the importance of local case studies at the international level. Mm -hmm. So obviously these studies are quite important for global level evidence synthesis, mm. but that importance may not be properly recognized at the national level. Mm. So that mm. may explain the lack of efforts for translating, you know, for example, Japanese language studies in, into English or something like that. So yeah, I, I think this is, the, the, there is a lack of the, the recognition of the importance mm -hmm. of local case studies in many countries. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, all right, and so uh, just, I think that that was the last of our of our actual questions that we had. Okay, yeah, great. The question and answer session. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, thank I couldn't so answer, much. I couldn't I, answer many of the questions properly. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, it, it's, yeah. it's okay. So we, we appreciate, we appreciate you doing great. the questions that we were able yeah, to give you. Great. And we, yeah, we know that you. it's been, it's been almost, uh, it's, it's a complex topic and it's yeah. <laughs> one yeah. that is actually one that requires a lot of discussion in order to be able to fully understand and think of ways in order to not only connect it between academic to academic, but also to academic and to everyday, uh, the work and the people who are, who are yeah. doing the conservation work. Yeah. So it's really yeah, yeah. wonderful that we're able to have this conversation because as you said, it's really important that people are able to understand what's going on here in mm -hmm. Taiwan and also what's going on elsewhere and that the information is able to flow. So that way we can all work better towards conservation goals and, yeah. and, and, and initiatives. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take our group picture, uh, our, our panelist pictures. So if we could, uh, set up the screen here for us. Okay, there we go. See, we've set up little frames. <laughs> Ooh, that looks great. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, Scott Lynn, are you going to join us for the photo? Will you join us? No? It will just be the no, three of us this time? <laughs> okay, okay, that's fine. Okay, so photo. then... Um, uh, just to let us know when, when you'll take the picture, Chunching. Okay. Three, two, one, smile. Okay. Okay, now one. Three, two, one. Okay, done. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And so now, thank just, you very much. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, I wanted to say thank you so much again to Tatsuya for talking with us today. I think that we've learned a lot about this topic of language barriers, and it's really opened our eyes in many ways to seeing how this is a, a really important yet, uh, it's one of the things that you maybe like Ross said, it's not really something that you maybe think about all the time, but it actually is one of the major things that uh, has an impact on our abilities to go ahead and work together in order to address conservation issues. So thank you so much for discussing us, uh, discussing this with us today. I would also like to remind everyone that we have our last webinar coming up on December 2nd. It will be a panel discussion on green energy development and bird habitat conservation in Taiwan. And we hope that you can join us for that. Also, a special thanks to the Forestry Bureau, the Taiwan Endemic Species Research Institute, our moderator, Dr. Ross Tsai, and our translators, Nayuka and Tracy Wong. Of course, 
again to our speaker, Dr. Tatsuya Amano. So thank you again so much for joining us today and sharing information about your great work and this important topic. All right, have a good rest of your day, everyone. Uh, bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.